everyone and welcome. I am Ram al a resident physician at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. And I'm very excited to welcome you today uh, to Global Cardiology University first webinar series. Uh, we will be discussing amelioric cardiomyopathy with our very special guest, Dr. Sihan Wan. And this session will be recorded and we will be sending uh, the recording to everyone so you can watch later at your convenience as well as uploading it online. Um, I wish to start with thanking our amazing uh, educators and wonderful co-founders, uh, Professor Dr. Nandan Anavaker and Dr. Anthony Kasho. And as some of you are new to our community, and this is our first uh, webinar in the series, we will start with a brief introduction about uh, what is Global Cardiology University. And then we will go ahead and uh, start with our discussion for today uh, on amyloid cardiomyopathy. I will hand it over to Dr. Anthony Kasho. Hi, John. Hi, Kim. Long time no see. How are you enjoying the first year of fellowship? It's been a lot of fun. It has certainly been a steep learning curve. I feel like we've entered a whole new world. How are you enjoying it? I couldn't agree more. Each rotation, from cath to echo to even seeing patients in and out of the hospital, I find myself always looking up answers to questions. I really enjoy the learning, but wish there was a resource to help us prepare for all we got ourselves into. It seems like we are back in medical school, drinking from a fire hose trying to keep up in this new and quickly evolving world. I couldn't agree more. Have you heard of Global Cardiology University? No, what's that? It's like a merge of your favorite entertainment streaming app with your favorite social media platform, but with all of cardiology content and the professional community without the fluff. Essentially creating a community filled with learners and teachers. I've been able to use this to prepare for my echo rotation, brush up on ECGs and general cardiology topics, and even connect with other fellows and experts around the world. Let me show you. You mentioned they have ECGs. I desperately need a refresher. Yes, they have a fully accredited ECG curriculum with hundreds of lectures organized in a way to make the learning easy with corresponding practice material and books. There's even a question bank of over 500 ECG cases with complete explanations of each interpretation. I've been told this is a perfect way to study for our board exams. They have explanations defining each diagnostic code and they even link to their other content which makes it easy and efficient in this learning process. That's amazing. You mentioned you used it to prepare for your echo rotation. How did you do that? Kim, you're going to love this. They have a complete echo course. It is designed with chalk talks that go through every topic in detail, from basic physics to prosthetic valves. This was a lifesaver during my echo rotation. It also helped with cath and all the general cardiology topics we are expected to know. There are also teachers available if you have any questions, which has helped clarify topics I used to struggle with. John, I'm blown away. So much for my Netflix subscription. Looks like I found what I'll be binging on for the next few years. That's exactly what I've been doing for the last few months. The website is globalcardiologyuniversity.com. Here's the trailer of their vision. Over the last several decades, the field of cardiology has witnessed an exponential growth in advancements and new developments. As a result, the volume of knowledge expected to learn has only grown and will continue to do so. However, the time provided to train future physicians is not prolonging drastically. As the field continues to evolve, no learner should be left behind. More efficient and effective learning pathways are needed. Learning is a lifelong journey and requires an environment coupled with a competent teacher and a learner that values the education being conveyed. We believe that this environment should be considered a community of diverse teachers and learners from all around the world. By creating a global learning community that houses and delivers education in a systematic and consistent manner, we hope for the first time to standardize the expected cardiology knowledge of a physician. All learners can connect to thought leaders across the globe, share their work, and create relationships that help transform careers. Welcome to Global Cardiology University, a cardiology fellow-led educational resource and community where cardiology knowledge is simplified, community learning is amplified, and professional growth is magnified. <laughs>
Wow, John, this is amazing. It really is. It's incredible to see all the good that can be accomplished when groups of educators work together. I'm going to be joining once I get home. What was the site again? GlobalCardiologyUniversity.com. Thanks so much, John. I'm so glad I ran into you. You've given me an abundance of hope, and I can't wait to get started. Well, I want to welcome you all. Thank you so much for joining us today. A really a heartfelt welcome to everyone joining us from whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening in your part of the world. Uh, it's really a true pleasure to have you with us this very special occasion, our inaugural webinar of Global Cardiology University. Today, we stand united in our belief that knowledge knows no borders. So knowledge knows no borders, and that's important. This principle is at the heart of everything we do here at Global Cardiology University. It's about more than just connecting people. It's about opening the doors of a world with new knowledge, innovation, and collaboration in the field of cardiology. And our vision has always been clear right from the start to empower healthcare professionals, students, and enthusiasts around the world with the latest insights, research, and practical skills to succeed. And we're committed to making high quality cardiology education accessible to all, breaking down barriers, and fostering a global community of learners and leaders. Now, this webinar marks the first step in that journey. We've curated an outstanding program for you, some of the best here hosting it for us, featuring some of the brightest minds in cardiology. They're not just here to share their knowledge, they're here to spark conversations, challenge ideas, and inspire action. So as we dive into today's session, I encourage you to engage with us, ask questions, connect with us. This is just the beginning. And this is more than an opportunity to learn. It's a chance to be a part of a global movement towards excellence and innovation in cardiology. Again, thank you for being here today, for sharing in our vision, and for being a part of this momentous day. Together, we're not just learning cardiology, we're shaping the future. Now enjoy the webinar, and I'm going to hand this back to the team that's been doing all the hard work to make this happen. Thank you, Anthony. And good evening, everyone. Thank you all again so much for joining us. My name is Hassan Ahmed, and I have the great pleasure of introducing our guest of honor, Dr. Siu Heen Wan. Dr. Wan is currently the Director of Outpatient Heart Failure at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. Dr. Wan graduated from the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He then went on to pursue his medical training at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where he completed his internal medicine residency, cardiology fellowship, and advanced training in echocardiography, heart failure, and transplant cardiology. Dr. Wan's research interests include the pathophysiology and novel therapeutics in the field of diastolic dysfunction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Before we begin, we ask that any questions the audience has for Dr. Wan to please enter them into the chat box below. We'll then have a moderated Q&A session at the end to discuss them. Dr. Wan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you so much for investing in our community. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hassan. And uh, first of all, I just uh, wish to welcome everyone. And uh, uh, truly a heartfelt thank you to my mentor and friend, Dr. Nadan Anabecker, as well as to Anthony, Rama, and many others behind the scenes that have made this platform and Global Cardiology University possible. Um, I'm very honored to be speaking to all of you and sharing one of my great passions, which is heart failure and cardiac amyloidosis. Um, so without further ado, I am going to transition over to my presentation. Um, and I appreciate your time while I, I share this, uh, this topic that I'm very passionate about with, with all of you. Um, so I'll be talking about cardiac amyloidosis today, but more importantly, um, we'll be talking about cardiac amyloidosis in the framework of heart failure. And in that spirit, um, I'd like to start with a case. Uh, first of all, I have no disclosures. And our objectives for today will be to describe the pathophysiology of heart failure and cardiac amyloidosis, summarize the diagnostic workup and imaging features of cardiac amyloidosis, and determine the prognosis and treatment for cardiac amyloidosis. This will run approximately 35 minutes or so, and I'll leave some time at the end 
um, to uh, make sure that uh, there, there's plenty of time for discussion and questions. So we'll start with our case, a 50 year old African-American gentleman who comes to your uh, cardiology clinic with worsening exertional dyspnea for about two months, has a history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, carpal tunnel syndrome, and otherwise no other fam family history of cardiomyopathy. On physical examination, there's jugular venous distension, bibasal crackles, and pitting edema of the lower extremities. These are all physical examination findings for heart failure. On EKG, it is notable for low voltage limb leads. And the next step, which is imaging or echocardiography, shows a preserved ejection fraction, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction of 55%, with significant diastolic dysfunction, thick walls and concentric hypertrophy, thick valves, thick right ventricle, and an abnormal strain pattern with apical sparing. We'll discuss more of this later uh, in the talk and exactly what these details are. A cardiac MRI was performed that demonstrated diffuse subendocardial late gadolinium enhancement. And labs were obtained that demonstrated abnormal serum and urine protein electrophoresis. Uh, free light chains were obtained. Immunofixation was obtained. Um, there was a normal cap and lambda ratio. No monoclonal protein spike and elevated uh, biomarkers, including nt B and P and troponin. Um, a PYP scan was performed, which was abnormal, and genetics was also performed, which demonstrated a VAL-122 isoleucine um, ATTR mutation. So we'll go over all the details. I really tried to include everything that was relevant, and, and this case really highlights everything from diagnosis um, all the way to uh, imaging, workup, um, and eventually we'll talk about treatment, and, and this highlights a typical case that we might see for a patient with cardiac amyloidosis. First of all, as, a, as an introduction um, and stepping away from cardiac amyloidosis a bit, I'd just like to talk about the heart and what heart failure is, because I think it's really important to understand that framework. Um, I understand um, today the audience includes residents, fellows, and even some medical students. So I'd like to start from the beginning and the basics, talk about the heart and heart failure, and then we'll dive in specifically to cardiac amyloidosis, which is a specific form of cardiomyopathy and can cause uh, infiltrate, a specific type of infiltrative cardiomyopathy and heart failure. So a brief and a quick review, the heart consists of four chambers. Um, blood, deoxygenated blood comes to the right atrium, goes to the right ventricle, is pumped up out the pulmonary arteries, goes to the lungs, picks up oxygen. Oxygenated blood comes to the left atrium, goes to the left ventricle. The left ventricle is the main chamber that pumps blood out to the aorta. So it generates a lot of pressure and the wall is generally thicker here compared to all the other chambers. And the oxygenated blood is pumped out the aorta to the entire body. There can be many ways in which heart failure develops. Heart failure, the way I like to think about it is that it is basically a mismatch between supply and demand of blood. So the oxygen that's required by the muscles and, and organs, um, there is a mismatch in the ability of the heart to supply that oxygen. So it could be that the left ventricle is not pumping appropriately. That would be heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It could be that it's squeezing appropriately, but it's not relaxing appropriately. A pump that pumps and squeezes, but doesn't really relax and fill with blood. That would be diastolic dysfunction. Um, among other things, we look at the structure and function of the heart. So we look at the size of the chamber and, and look at the amount of squeeze. And specifically, that's generally the thickening. Um, and uh, in your uh, education and training, I'm sure with echocardiography, you learn that it's not necessarily the movement of the walls, but the function is determined on the thickening of the walls. So that's a very uh, important feature and one that we'll come back to when we talk about echocardiography. In general, the framework for thinking about cardiac disease, and this is not only for heart failure, but truly for everything in cardiology, and one can even apply this to topics outside of cardiology, we can say for internal medicine in general, 
the idea is to think about the condition, think about the diagnosis of it, the etiology, so what causes that condition, be able to classify the severity of it, discuss prognosis, so what are the outcomes for this particular condition, and all of these things, the severity, the etiology, all of these guide management and how we treat the condition. So for heart failure, we think about the different etiologies and cardiac amyloidosis is one etiology um, that could cause heart failure. We think about the severity, we think about NYHA classification in terms of functional um, severity. We think about ACCHA uh, staging in terms of the prognosis and the severity. And we think about management and medical management and potentially for some conditions, procedural and surgical management. So what is heart failure? I think heart failure is challenging to think about because heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. It's not an imaging diagnosis. It's not a lab diagnosis. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges um, facing clinicians is that um, many perceive heart failure to be a lab diagnosis or a, an imaging diagnosis. So heart failure truly, is, as we talked about, as we discussed earlier, is a mismatch between supply and demand. Um, and thus, in this situation, heart failure results in specific signs and symptoms. So as a clinical diagnosis, there are signs on, phys uh, on uh, history, and there are exam features on uh, physical exam findings that indicate heart failure, and generally they're fluid overload. Um, so that's why, despite all the advances in technology and our advances in lab diagnosis and, and imaging and echocardiography and cardiac MRI, which we will talk about for amyloidosis, it is still absolutely essential to obtain a very good history and perform a very good physical examination. Because at the end of the day, heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. And someone could have a low ejection fraction, but not have any symptoms, Right. So they truly have, uh, in that situation, they would have preclinical uh, systolic or diastolic dysfunction. You still need to treat that, but they don't have classic heart failure per se because they don't have heart failure symptoms. So that's what we mean when we say heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. It's based on the presence of symptoms and abnormal physical examination findings. There are many different ways we can classify heart failure. Um, I'm going to skip down to restrictive versus dilated cardiomyopathy. So... Um, Cardiac amyloidosis is part of the infiltrative cardiomyopathy family, which means abnormal proteins um, are deposited into the heart, and that causes the heart to be stiff and have a restrictive pattern um, on echocardiography. There are many other different ways. I'm not going to kind of go over all of them, but there are many different ways to think about heart failure, and I think these different frameworks help us classify, help us uh, determine the severity, help us determine prognosis, staging, etc. I also want to um, show this graph was a uh, work um, with uh, one of my mentors, uh, Hong Chen, at the Mayo Clinic, in which we looked at prognosis um, and the severity of heart failure. So, what does this chart indicate? This this figure really indicates the importance of early identification of heart failure. So, so stage C and D is what we traditionally think about heart failure. We, we define heart failure as uh, examination and history findings. It's, it's a clinical syndrome. But the ACCHA, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, really um, uh, established stage A and stage B heart failure, which are risk factors or abnormal imaging findings and abnormal physiology in the absence of um, heart failure symptoms for stage B, the uh, emphasis on these is really for prevention. So prevention of development of symptomatic heart failure, which is what we traditionally think about for heart failure, and also early identification. We think about risk factors, and we think about both cardiac risk factors and non-cardiac risk factors. We think about etiology. So as we talk about the treatment of amyloidosis towards the end of the talk, um, we will highlight why it's so important for early identification. If they get to stage D, C and D heart failure with cardiac amyloidosis, it's really a little bit too late to change the trajectory, 
right? And this same concept is repeated over and over again for all sorts of cardiovascular disease. If we think about valve disease, aortic stenosis, right? The concept is to identify patients before they fall off the cliff, right? So you want to treat severe symptomatic aortic stenosis because that's the time when you know they're going to fall off the cliff. But you don't necessarily have to treat severe aortic stenosis if it's asymptomatic and there are no signs of left ventricular dysfunction or chamber dilatation. Um, these would be, this is basically looking at the curve. Same thing for coronary artery disease. Again, we look at when pe patients fall off the curve and we time our intervention, whether that be um, stents or, or uh, ca cardiac surgery with bypass surgery. We time that with when we think patients are going to fall off the curve and you want to treat them right before that point. So I think the concept of this figure is very important in that we want to identify that inflection point. In this case, for heart failure, we want to identify patients before they transition from stage B to stage C and D, where they have a very poor prognosis. And finally, um, to wrap up I can, kind of our summary of heart failure, we think about the thickness, right? So the thickness and the volume of the heart should reflect the hemodynamics. Okay. So in this situation, normal geometry is down on the bottom left corner. If we think about eccentric hypertrophy on the bottom right-hand corner, this is generally a volume issue when the heart deals with a lot of volume. The chamber dilates and there's greater volume. When the heart has to deal with a lot of pressure, it's concentric hypertrophy on the top right of the figure because there's the, the chamber has to deal with high pressures. The wall thickens in order to accommodate that. So generally, the shape, the thickness of the wall and the size or the volume of the chamber is dependent on the hemodynamics. When there is a mismatch, that is when you tend to worry, meaning if they had not have longstanding hypertension or aortic stenosis or increased afterload, basically reasons why they should have concentric hypertrophy, but they still do have concentric hypertrophy, such as for a young patient without any prior cardiovascular disease, that's when you start to worry that maybe something else is going on and cardiac amyloidosis is one of those potential etiologies that could cause it, right? So the way I think about it is, is it really appropriate for the patient based on their comorbidities or is the shape and thickness and, and size of the heart inappropriate based on their comorbidities? Okay, so pressure, thickness, increased thickness, volume, dilation, increased chamber size. And we can see this on cardiac MRI or on echocardio. Okay, so in the interest of time, we'll keep moving and we'll move to amyloidosis. So what is amyloidosis? I think a lot of us hear this term, but it's a little bit esoteric. It's certainly not the most common condition out there. But I think the it's an important condition to understand because first, it's very underdiagnosed. And second, I think the pathophysiology clearly um, highlights the importance of that flow chart figure um, from the beginning. And it's very logical as we transition from understanding pathophysiology to the severity, to management, prognosis, all those, all those uh, components of the flow chart. Amyloidosis basically means that there are extracellular deposits of abnormal protein fibrils. And these are generally beta pleated sheets and they deposit in a variety of different organs. For the, this case today, uh, with it being cardiology, of course, we'll focus on the heart, but note that abnormal proteins can also deposit in many other different organs, including kidneys, liver, and the nervous system. And in fact, some of these comorbid conditions, such as bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, can be manifested from amyloid proteins being deposited uh, in that situation uh, in the nervous system. So that is one of the components of the case from the beginning, but bilateral, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome should raise um, suspicion for potential amyloidosis. <laughs> 
for instances of cardiac amyloidosis and with a focus on the heart, there are really two main ones we want to talk about today. One is light chain, amyloid light chain or AL, and one is um, transarretin or ATTR. And what this means is basically kind of what the abnormal proteins are, where they are formed. That is very important to understand because that has implications for treatment. So this figure um, from Dr. Martha Grogan highlights the fact that AL or amyloid light amyloid light chain amyloidosis, the abnormal protein factory, uh, are the plasma cells in the bone marrow. So the bone marrow generates these abnormal light chains, hence the L light chains um, that uh, is AL uh, amyloidosis, and when they deposit in the heart, it becomes cardiac. AL amyloidosis. The second common one that we find for cardiac amyloidosis are um, transarretin proteins or abnormally folded transarretin proteins. Transarretin is actually a thyroid uh, um, uh, transfer protein. Um, and when these are abnormal um, and the, the abnormal protein factory is in the liver, in this situation, not the bone marrow, but the liver. So the liver generates these abnormal um, transarretin proteins, they get abnormally folded, um, they uh, can be unstable, and they deposit in the heart. And when the heart has proteins that are not muscle, right, that it becomes stiff, it's not appropriate, it shouldn't be there, it should be muscle, it should contract, but rather we get these abnormal proteins. One of the unique things about ATTR amyloid is that there are really two components. There's hereditary, sometimes we see the label H, ATTRH, or mutant M or variant V, um, or the wild type version, um, ATTRWT. Um, the wild type was previously known as senile because um, this is kind of the uh, acquired version. It's thought to be found in o the older population compared to hereditary. We don't uh, use that term um, anymore. Um, it's, it's not really... Um, uh, it's not really very accurate. It's not only found in uh, elderly patients, um, but we classify, we subclassify ATTR into hereditary type or wild type, which is more of an acquired type. We kind of talked about this already, transferritin produced in the liver, transport thyroid uh, hormone. Um, when it's abnormal, it's TTR, uh, amyloid, and when it deposits in the heart, it causes cardiomyopathy. Uh, we focus on TTR amyloid, uh, cardiac am uh, amyloid cardiomyopathy, because this is one of the ones that we treat in cardiology. AL amyloid is a bone marrow problem, so that is really in the realm of our uh, hematology oncology colleagues, and we work closely with them um, to uh, uh, discuss chemotherapy treatment. Um, but TTR amyloid is something we're able to treat in cardiology. We'll, we'll talk about some of the specific treatment um, agents. I think the figure on the right, um, also courtesy of Dr. Grogan, um, highlights the really three different components or the three different mechanisms in which TTR amyloid can be treated. And we'll return to this towards the end. But if we think about this is a wonderful highlight of uh, the mechanism and the, the importance of understanding the pathophysiology because that directly affects the mechanism of our drugs and how they're treated. So here in this situation, um, really the liver produces abnormal protein. The protein circulates in the blood. Then the proteins are deposited in the heart. So there are really three potential opportunities to stop this. One is stop the production in the liver. The second is when the abnormal proteins are floating in the blood, they are stabilized and they're not able to be deposited into the heart. And the third are really fibro disruptors and uh, kind of they, they're able to dissolve the abnormal protein, so to say. So they're really the ideal situation, but they're able to disrupt these abnormal fibros. The, uh, we'll come back to this uh, when we talk about treatment, but it's, our emphasis is really on stabilizing protein. That's the agent that we currently have approved for treatment. Uh, but there is ongoing research across the spectrum in terms of how we're able to treat 
TTR amyloid. Okay, so what is the epidemiology of cardiac amyloidosis and the heart? So age of onset for AL amyloidosis is generally a little bit younger, so age greater than 40 years old. ATTR is a little bit older, uh, age greater than 70 years old, although this is a spectrum. Um, uh, and and we see uh, patients that could be uh, of, of any age. The cardiac symptoms are generally heart failure symptoms. So we talked about heart failure already, but they're dyspnea, low extremity edema, bad congestion, syncope. These are the signs and symptoms of heart failure. And they're generally heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So the muscle is contracting appropriately, but the walls are thick, the heart is stiff, and it's not able to relax because of all the protein deposition. These abnormal protein deposition can also cause a lot of arrhythmias. So patients with cardiac amyloidosis often have, they may have bradycardia and dysfunction, AB block, ventricular arrhythmias. Atrial fibrillation is extremely common. That is in general with heart failure was preserved, ejection fraction, but particularly so with cardiac amyloidosis. Other uh, important considerations include thromboembolism, and there is a high... Um, prevalence of aortic stenosis as well. One of the features is that things tend to be thick in general. So walls are thick, valves are thick, right ventricle is thick. Um, these are these abnormal proteins that are deposited. So everything is thicker than what you would normally expect. AL amyloidosis, I will go through this briefly, but can involve the kidneys, peripheral neuropathy. We talked about carpal tunnel syndrome already, gastrointestinal syndrome. Um, and macroglossia, orbital purpura, some more unique, um, but not necessarily um, very uh, sensitive um, find, uh, physical examination findings. EKG commonly have low voltage. Now, this is not very specific, of course, to cardiac amyloidosis because someone who is very obese, for example, or have bad COPD can also have low voltage on EKG, but taking in the correct clinical context along with everything else, I think it should raise the suspicion, at least, um, of cardiac amyloidosis. We talked about the restrictive versus dilated cardiomyopathy as a classification framework of heart failure in cardiac amyloidosis. The pattern tends to be restrictive cardiomyopathy. Again, that means the heart is stiff, walls are thick, uh, high pressures are needed from the atrium to the ventricle, from the top to the bottom part of the heart to push blood into the ventricle. And we think about idiopathic restrictive cardiomyopathies, could be genetic. We think about secondary, right? So cardiac amyloidosis, is in the category of infiltrative cardiomyopathies. Those include sarcoidosis, could also be hemochromatosis, which is iron deposition disease. And another uh, rare condition, such as storage diseases or Fabry's disease and cancer and radiation can also cause a very stiff heart. Echocardiographic features, I'll kind of go over this briefly, but basically for restrictive cardiomyopathy, we often see large atrium because of large uh, high pressures in the top part of the heart. Um, we see um, normal volumes, but thickened walls. Normal volumes, but thickened walls. Remember that two by two table that we saw about concentric hypertrophy and uh, eccentric hypertrophy in this situation because it's stiff, and uh, the walls are thick with deposition, but the chamber is not necessarily dilated. Um, this is kind of a, a little bit more advanced discussion of diastolic dysfunction, but basically these uh, echocardiographic features show that a lot of pressure is required from the atrium to force blood into the ventricle. Um, and this is reflected um, in the... Um, Mitral inflow velocities, also the heart is stiff and not moving very well. That's related in the decreased septal and lateral E prime um, on tissue Doppler. So here on the right, we see this uh, autopsy uh, finding from amyloidosis where the heart muscle is quite thick, right? And the, the chamber size is not necessarily increased, but the wall is very, very thick. We see this on echocardiogram, um, and we see this myocardial speckling appearance. That's um, 
often described as the uh, ultrasound image is more clear than one might expect for, for echocardiography. We talked about dilated atria thickening everywhere. And patients may also have pericardial effusions. Here's one parasternal long axis view, again, reiterating that concept. Strain, so this was highlighted in our case, but there's this apical sparing pattern. What this means, so um, the darker the red, the more normal it is. So this is apical sparing. So it's abnormal in the base of the heart, abnormal in the mid portion of the heart. So on the left figure in the base of the heart, the mid portion of the heart is um, decreased in terms of its uh, uh, strain or, or, or movement, um, but it's preserved in the apex. Sometimes this is described as a cherry on top pattern. This is uh, specific for um, cardiac amyloidosis. We don't really know why. There have been um, theories as to potentially how the heart muscle fibrils are arranged at the tip of the heart and at the apex. Um, you know, again, we don't exactly know why, but this is a very specific pattern that we see in patients with cardiac amyloidosis. So this should raise a suspicion of cardiac amyloidosis. And this should also indicate that whenever the walls are thick or we have a clinical suspicion of cardiac amyloidosis to perform an add-on strain when we're doing echocardiography. Labs can be abnormal. Troponin and BNP or anti-proBNP often are elevated. And here we have a flow chart from up to date showing how we go about diagnosing cardiac amyloidosis. So oftentimes echocardiography and cardiac MRI are performed first whenever we have a clinical suspicion that may be heart failure symptoms and or abnormal imaging findings when the images are performed for some other reason. Then um, it really is separated, first of all, determining whether or not they have cardiac amyloidosis, but determining specifically which type, whether it's AL, or its TTR. So for this particular case, the labs were actually normal. So the three important labs to assess for AL cardiac amyloidosis are serum kappa and lambda free light chain ratio. Right? Remember the L in AL amyloidosis stands for abnormal light chains. So it makes sense that we are doing serum free light chain testing. It is a cancer condition. So remember, whenever it's a cancer condition, it's the same copy uh, replicating over and over again. So what we should see is we should see spikes on serum protein immunofixation and electrophoresis. Basically, there's one protein that's very abnormal compared to everything else uh, versus something like a polyclonal increased gammopathy where that might happen with renal dysfunction or other reasons where everything, all the proteins are elevated. When all the proteins are elevated, it's not really a cancer per se, or AL, cardiac amyloidosis. If that's positive, right, then that is a diagnosis of AL, cardiac amyloidosis, okay? The second part that has to be done is a PYP scan. So the PYP scan, it's a bone tracer study that basically looks to see whether or not the heart lights up. It compares the left side of the chest with the right side of the chest. So think of it almost as a nuclear scan that's similar to a chest X-ray. But basically, if the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart compared is abnormal, that side, the, the left side of the, the chest where the heart is, if it lights up, right, then that's an abnormal PYP or a scintigraphy scan, right? And if it's grade two or three, that is a diagnosis of cardiac TTR. If it's grade zero, it's not, and that's ruled out for TTR amyloidosis. Um, sometimes if it's grade one, that might require the next step, the more definitive step, which is an endomyocardial biopsy as an invasive test to confirm in time. So this is truly the workup. And then at the very end on the bottom right, you see also genetic testing can be performed to determine whether it's wild type or mutant TTR. Um, but that's the concept. So it's a clinical suspicion imaging. And then really the two components are the lab tests and urine tests to assess for AL cardiac amyloidosis, and the imaging test of PYP scan to assess for TTR cardiac amyloidosis. Um, in the interest of time, we will skip this. We'll skip the details of the imaging. Um, 
I wanted to highlight this natural progression. So, so uh, kind of look at the description here. It says time from onset of TTR amyloid deposits. Right? So remember when we talked about treatment of cardiac amyloidosis, truly the treatment is in that middle stage of the three parts of the figure, right? It's the stabilizers. Stabilizers means it prevents further deposition of these abnormal proteins into the heart. It doesn't dissolve it. They're not fibro disruptors. It's not that last stage, right? And it doesn't stop production from the liver. It's not the first stage. It stabilizes what's in the serum and prevents it from depositing into the heart. What does that mean? That means the earlier you're able to identify patients, the better it is. If they get to stage C, stage D heart failure, and they have a lot of symptoms, it's too late because all you're preventing is preventing further deposition. But it's already too late. There's a lot of abnormal proteins deposited into the heart. If you're able to identify TTR amyloid patients early, right, you're able to provide them better outcomes because you're stabilizing it and you're basically freezing it, freezing their clinical condition and preventing it from getting worse. That's why I think this figure is really important because the idea is you want to identify these patients early. You don't want to wait until systolic dysfunction when the ejection fraction drops. That's too late. You don't want to wait until they have dyspnea, fatigue, or clinical symptoms, right? You want to get it early, right? When we have these abnormal imaging tests, right? On the bottom, the PET scan, the PYP scan, that's early. When they have orthopedic manifestations, bilateral, bilateral carpal tunnel, right? That's early. So we want to think about cardiac amyloidosis early before they have bad heart failure symptoms, because by that time, it's too late um, to really treat effectively. What is the prognosis? Why is that important? Well, the uh, we could start with AL. So AL cardiac amyloidosis, if you um, search for it online, oftentimes it's quoted to be six months survival, right? Six months. Think, think about that. Um, this is really often described as a ticking time bomb. You really have to identify early. Once you identify it, you have to refer to hematology and oncology for treatment. This cannot wait. This is an emergency consultation, right? But it can improve with appropriate treatment, with chemotherapy. This can improve to five to six years. So AL cardiac, all cardiac amyloidosis is, impo is important to identify early, but particularly AL because it's such fast progressing. For TTR, it could be in the range of three to five years, both for wild type and for hereditary. Um, and But this is you know, what's quoted in the literature, right? And if we look back at this figure, if we are able to identify these patients early and treat early, we probably have even better outcomes than what's identified in the literature. So I think this does vary a lot. And oftentimes for patients that have no signs or symptoms, normal ejection fraction, everything else is normal, but they have TTR cardiac amyloidosis identified for another reason, I really counsel them that their median survival should be better than the three to five years because we identify it early, we're able to stabilize it and prevent it from getting worse. So we have a few minutes left and I really want to spend a bit of time on the treatment. Okay, so how do we treat? There is only for TTR cardiac amyloidosis, there's really one FDA approved treatment and that is in the stabilizing category, in this middle category, and that's to have this, right? So again, this freezes the clinical condition. It stabilizes these abnormal proteins in the serum and prevents it from depositing into the heart. But it doesn't treat what doesn't cure it. It doesn't dissolve what's already in the heart. If the heart is stiff, that's going to remain, right? It doesn't stop the production necessarily. There is technically... Um, a curative option. The curative option generally would be in young patients with um, mutant or, or, or uh, hereditary uh, TTR, cardiac amyloidosis. This is one of the reasons why it's important to do genetic testing and identify hereditary versus uh, a wild type. If they have either young patient, um, good surgical candidate, right? They have hereditary type, TTR amyloidosis. Um, it would be worth it to consider liver transplant because in that situation you're basically affecting the abnormal protein factory right in TTR amyloid it's the liver so if you do that that could potentially be curative from the AL standpoint our hematology oncology colleagues oftentimes will do a bone marrow biopsy um, and they may consider a, a bone marrow transplant so so the idea is if we affect the production the factory of these abnormal proteins, that could theoretically be a curative option. 
But in terms of our medications, there are research medications on both sides, both the stopping production and also disrupting fibrils, but nothing currently, uh, nothing else is currently FDA approved. There, uh, uh, I guess I should put that as a caveat. So uh, patisseran, um uh, is approved, but it's mainly some of these um, early uh, uh, stage treatment, um, stopping the production in the liver. They're approved for neuropathic purposes, so amyloidosis with neuropathy symptoms. They're not approved for cardiomyopathy, although research has demonstrated that in that population that get it, the cardiomyopathy actually improves. So there's ongoing study both on these, uh, on um, you know, tercin and patisseran, um, both on cardiomyopathy, uh, and its effects and its benefits, as well as other uh, ongoing um, agents. This is a New England Journal of Medicine article that came out in 2018, demonstrating the benefit in all-cause mortality of the use of tefam this compared to placebo. And what other considerations are important? So in addition to tefamidus for halting the progression of cardiac amyloidosis with TTR, it is also important to uh, consider our other heart failure medi medications. So spironolactone could be an effective medication for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and anecdotally particularly helpful for patients with cardiac amyloidosis. Beta blockers should be used cautiously because these patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy, their cardiac output, uh, which is a um, uh, the product of heart rate um, and uh, stroke volume, they're often dependent on the heart rate. So beta blockers should be used cautiously. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers should be used cautiously due to uh, risk of orthostatic hypertension in patients having syncope. However, patients often prog may progress to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And then oftentimes it is, it is important to start some of these um, guideline-directed medical therapy, um, all, all, although at low doses and used cautiously. It is important to think about arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, and anticoagulation for stroke prevention. Um, it is uh, a little bit unclear if uh, a defibrillator is beneficial, but of course, if they have a secondary indication, if their ejection fracture is very reduced, if they've had a lot of ventricular tachycardia or ventricular arrhythmia, certainly to consider an implantable defibrillator. Uh, thromboembolism prevention, um, thinking about comorbid conditions such as aortic stenosis, um, where we talked about liver transplantation. Treating neuropathy as well. So we talked about patisseran and using some of these other uh, medications um, to treat the neuropathy and TTR amyloidosis. And then for AL, uh, rapid referral to our hematology oncology colleagues to discuss initiation of chemotherapy in a condition that rapidly progresses. Okay, so um, we're wrapping up, uh, going back to the case. Now, hopefully the case makes a little bit more sense in terms of the information that um, we have included and why it's, it is relevant in the thinking of cardiac amyloidosis and heart failure. Um, and we uh, finish with reviewing the objectives. We talked about the pathophysiology of heart failure and cardiac amyloidosis. We summarized the diagnostic workup and the imaging features, um, specifically echocardiography, cardiac MRI, PYP scan. And then we talked about the prognosis and treatment for cardiac amyloidosis, how this is a rapidly progressing disease. It's important to identify patients early as our treatment with tefamidus for TTR cardiac amyloidosis halts the progression, but doesn't directly reverse or cure this condition. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your time and attention. I want to thank everyone um, in uh, Global Cardiology University, um, Dr. Nandan Andavekar, um, Anthony, Rama, Hassan, um, and everyone behind the scenes really um, to put together a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, and uh, again, I'm quite honored and thankful to be able to be one of your speakers tonight and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Vaughn, for such an informative talk. Uh, as, as a trainee, I struggle like navigating the nuances for cardiac amyloid. And after your talk, I feel a lot more confident next time you see a patient with cardiac amyloidosis. And I'm sure a lot of our attendees today have a lot of burning questions, and I'll transition into the Q&A session. I see the first question I have is from Abir, one of our attendees, who asked, 
to what extent can we detect amyloid disease in patients before it causes cardiac amyloidosis so that these treatments are actually effective in preventing uh, overt like decompensation? So I'm assuming the question is like, can we even detect it early enough? How good are we at it? Yeah, that is really the million dollar question here, right? So how can we detect it early enough? Can we actually prevent this from happening? Okay. So there are actually ongoing studies looking at um, whether or not tefamidus will, will work. So, so right now tefamidus is approved for treatment of TTR um, cardi uh, amyloid cardiomyopathy. Um, you know, what's unclear is whether or not patients at high risk of developing it would benefit from prevention of the of this development, right? So we look at this figure, um, which I really like because it shows the time from onset of, of deposits. We see that imaging findings, right, and biomarkers are really early, even before we see echo findings and certainly before we see clinical symptoms, right? So one of the potential ways in which we study this, and this is these are ongoing research projects, right? But one of the things we know, for example, and that's published in the literature, is that approximately 10 years before a first-degree relative develops a hereditary TTR cardiac amyloidosis, that is the time frame when we start to worry and think whether or not um, the relative first degree relative may develop TTR cardiac amyloidosis. So as you can, can imagine, one of the interesting things is if these patients, right, were to get something, a, a research drug or to this, would that prevent the development or progression of TTR cardiac amyloidosis? We don't know. There are studies ongoing to study this question. What I will say is that patients, so I oftentimes see patients in my clinic, they come in, they have an echo for completely unrelated reason, right? And there are imaging features. Oftentimes we, we have a, we are fortunate to have a very strong echo lab and a very strong cardiac MRI lab. And our, our uh, imagers will raise the question, right? Oh, this looks like it could be cardiac amyloidosis, maybe the strain is abnormal, maybe the walls are very sick, maybe on the cardiac MRI, we have that diffuse uh, uh, a subendocardial enhancement, right? Um, there's a, a ongoing research looking at uh, extracellular volume, ECV, in uh, CT or cardiac MRI that can uh, hint at the cardiac amyloidosis. If the patient, the patient might not have anything else, completely, otherwise maybe have a relatively normal echocardi echocardiogram, certainly have no clinical symptoms, right? Nothing late stage, normal ejection fraction. So in, the, in those patients, they may be diagnosed with TTR cardiac amyloidosis, right? Their PYP scan is three plus, it's abnormal, right? That confirms that they have TTR cardiac amyloidosis. We start treatment with um, tefamidus and these patients do well. They do much better than the three to five years. Right, that's uh, 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 predicted. You know the the uh, average life expectancy untreated. So, you know, we certainly think that in this population, it's beneficial and it makes sense based on the pathophysiology of stabilizing these abnormal proteins. But as to the degree of benefit, as to how early it benefits, I think all it's you know it's such a new. Uh, field, you know, and, and we are identifying so many more. A lot of patients in the past, we diagnosed them with heart failure and they pass away. You know, if we do autopsies, people looked at the, the autopsy studies on heart failure patients, a lot of them actually have amyloid. We just never diagnosed them. So yes, amyloidosis is rare, but it's probably not that rare just because we're under diagnosing a lot of it. So I think as we identify a lot more of it, we'll be able to answer more and more of this question about how early to treat, what's the benefit of treating. Um, but I, I, I think that's a wonderful question. We certainly don't have all the answers, but it is a continuing area of study. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Dr. Wan, for your phenomenal presentation. Another question we have from the audience is, among patients who are undergoing TAVI, how often are they found to have ATTR, cardiac amyloidosis? And in your opinion, should our workup prior to TAVI include assessing for amyloidosis since both subsets will have thick walls? 
Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a wonderful question. So the question is uh, uh, in regards to um, the TAVR patients um, and and uh, uh, as a comorbid condition in, in cardiac amyloidosis. So at our program right now, we are working very closely with our structural colleagues to uh, to answer this question. It very much, I think, depends on a center's uh, uh, population, right? So um, epidemiologically, we know based on their age, their comorbidities, we certainly know there is an overlap, right? But I think the percentage, the exact percentage varies depending on the TAVR population that a particular program sees, right? So what we have found in our program is that a lot of patients, you know, I shouldn't say a lot, there are some patients that undergo TAVR, but that don't do well afterwards. We continue their heart failure treatment and their workup, and they end up having cardiac amyloidosis, right? So it's important to be able to identify these patients early, right? It's, it's really important from a heart failure side for treatment. It's important for our structural colleagues too, right? And that's the argument to develop a program because the last thing we want is for a surgeon, right? Or for a proceduralist to treat a patient and only for the patient to do worse, right? And not be happy because that wasn't the underlying problem. So I think it's important. And, and one of the things we, we do it is we talked about ECV or extracellular volume. Um, so with our, uh, with some of our uh, really advanced imagers um, in our program, we are looking at uh, studies that are already obtained as part of the workup for TAVR, what information we can extract that's associated with development of cardiac amyloidosis, identify those high risk patients, right? And do an expedited workup. So we know whether or not they have cardiac amyloidosis. You know, surprisingly, we've actually identified quite a few patients that way. And it's, I, I think it is important, um, you know, uh, area to think about referrals, right? Because oftentimes patients don't come in, you know, cardiac amyloid, you know, amyloid Car uh, cardiac amyloidosis, patients don't walk in and say, I have cardiac amyloidosis, I need treatment, right? Whereas something else, I mean, someone might walk in and say, I have hypertension, I need treatment. That might be from their primary care, right? That we see those commonly. Or I have coronary artery disease, I need treatment. That's more common, right? But people don't walk in and say, I have cardiac amyloidosis. So it really are referrals from general cardiologists. It's referrals from our structural colleagues that see a lot of TAVR patients that have a, a association. It's uh, referrals from orthopedic surgeons, right, that may never think about you know, cardiac amyloidosis, but we think about bilateral carpal tunnel. We've had a couple of patients come our way from our orthopedic surgeons, right, they're concerned about bilateral carpal tunnel. And then really primary care, you know, to really think about these abnormalities, they might, it might, referrals might come through the echo lab. So I think, so, so, you know, the bottom line is, yes, there, there definitely is an overlap with our um, aortic stenosis patients in general, right? We don't know the exact percentage, it really depends on the population and the risk factors of the population, but I think it's an important area to continue to investigate. Thank you, Dr. Wan. Uh, another question I have from an attendee, it is our, regarding the role of SCLT2 inhibitors for uh, cardiac amyloid specifically. Yeah, that, that is a true. wonderful question. And SGLT2 is you know, really within the last couple of years have been absolutely, uh, you know, they've transformed the treatment of heart failure rate, right? We know that they are good for patients, you know, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. They're in the armamentarium, one of four categories, along with beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin uh, receptor blockers, and entresto, um, as well as uh, mineral uh, 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 MRAs uh, or spironolactone, right? So they're one of the four important categories for guideline-directed medical therapy. They are also really one of the first medications to be effective for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, right? With the Empereg trial, really, the empagliflozin, but you know we we see this you know, for as a class effect for for the SGLT2 class in general. But you know, aside from top cat sub study that demonstrated some benefit with spironolactone with heart failure preserved ejection fraction, really the SGLT2 is a revolutionized treatment um, for. Um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. As to, and we know this is whether or not patients have diabetes, right? Regardless of whether they have diabetes, there's a beneficial heart failure effect. 
So coming back to SGLT2s and amyloidosis, if we think about the pathophysiology, right, of amyloidosis, SGLT2 does not directly impact the pathophysiology of cardiac amyloidosis. So no, it's not going to cure, you know, amyloidosis. It's not going to stabilize TTR amyloidosis. That requires one of the agents we talked about in the spectrum, right, the three categories. Having said that, right, does SGLT2 help you know, it depends. I, I think the question is, it depends. If there's a reduced ejection fraction, you really try to do everything possible to improve that ejection fraction, right? And I think SGLT2 is part of the armamentarium, as with everything. I mentioned that beta blockers should be used cautiously and, uh, uh, you know, ACE arms should be used cautiously. But I think, you know, it, you know, with that whole suite of tools that we have, that does help improve ejection fraction. And we know EF is directly related to outcomes and life expectancy and rehospitalization. So I, I think in that situation, when the ejection fraction is low, it's clear that it's beneficial just because the ejection fraction is low and you're treating heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. When the ejection fraction is preserved, I think that's a, a more challenging situation. I don't know, you know, whether or not it will help, um, because I think we don't really specifically some studies, you know, break it up in terms of the heterogeneous population with the HEFPATH population, right? And that's the problem with a lot of the early HEFPATH studies is everyone's lumped in together. So I think we don't know. It's probably reasonable to be worth a try for more for symptom management to see if it helps with symptoms and be hospitalization. Um, but I would say um, from a physiology standpoint, it might be an adjunct. It's certainly not going to cure uh, uh, TTR cardiac amyloidosis, but I would use it just like sp I use spironolactam. Spironolactam anecdotally has been helpful. Maybe it's a little bit of diuretic effect. Maybe that helps patients feel better, but I would kind of use that in, in that spectrum. And that's how I would discuss it with uh, patients might be worth a try in the preserved ejection fraction uh, uh, population to see if it helps with symptoms. Thank you, Dr. Wan. Another uh, question from the audience is, how do you incorporate the role of cardiac transplant in the different subgroups of patients with amyloidosis? Yeah, yeah. So cardiac transplantation. So a couple comments on this. I think one of the biggest challenges, um, you know, to start off with is oftentimes we identify cardiac amyloidosis patients late, right? So we looked at the epidemiology, right? If they are 70 or above, they are not going to be a good heart transplant candidate, period. And regardless of everything else, just in general, that population. And we know there is a supply and demand issue, right? We don't have, there is not enough, not enough of a supply of hearts, right? And there is a huge waiting list for candidates. So if someone is above the age of 70, they have cardiac amyloidosis, it is probably not going to happen with a heart transplant. Now, this, and this was in my slide, we talked about heart and liver transplant. So generally, the situation for these young patients, right, we talked about mutant um, or hereditary TTR amyloid um, and the liver transplant being potentially curative because you're stopping, right, the abnormal protein factory. So this is a situation where, you know, yes, and, and this has to be kind of an aggressive you know, heart transplant center willing to take on high risk, right? So Mayo Clinic, you know, has done this, right? But in select patients, certainly not in everyone. We think about transplant for restrictive cardiomyopathy. We look at the population, you know, a lot more heart transplants are done for the dilated cardiomyopathies. It's generally with low ejection fraction, really dilated heart, right? Those are generally the ones that get a heart transplant, not the, not the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, like those are rare or, or restrictive cardiomyopathies. So I think it really is a, a unique patient in that they're younger, you know, they are, they're good surgical candidates, so they don't have, you know, you know, a, a lot of um, comorbidities such as, you know, end-stage renal disease or other things that make them really, you know, bad candidates. They have a potentially curative option. So a, a hereditary TTR cardiac amyloidosis, which their liver can be transplanted at the same time. So it will be a heart or, or you know, around the same period, not necessarily at the exact same time, but the idea of a heart liver transplant. So kind of everything has to align for it to be considered, okay? Certainly, you know, can be considered and can be done, but I would say it is on the more rare side. And that's certainly not the first thing I'd think about 
um, in terms of treatment of cardiac amyloidosis, I'd say a heart transplant is, is, is relatively uncommon. Thank you, Dr. Rowan. There's a lot of interest in the comment section, a lot of questions coming in. Just for the interest of time, we'll stick to one or two more questions. The next question I have from attendee is, does defamidus increase life expectancy with increasing morbidity? Yes, yeah. So a uh, question of tafamidus and increasing life expectancy. So so yes, it does. But exactly how much, I would argue that we, again, don't know because that's depending on how early we get to patients, right? So the three to five years that's often quoted in the literature, right, that's without treatment, um, treating with tafamidus may extend, you know, in the studies by a few years, right? But I think the how many years is the question, right? So I would argue that the earlier we're able to identify it based on the physiology and the, and the mechanism of how tafamidus works, the earlier it is, right, the longer the life expectancy. And I've seen patients, you know, now, you know, for, you know, that have, you know, done well for for many years. So I think the exactly how much is to be determined, but I would argue that the earlier we're able to identify and treat, right, the the better the um, the outcomes. But yes, definitely um, improves mortality and an expectation of, you know, along with that improves function and also reduces hospitalization as well. So that's, that's why to this, you know, one of the biggest challenges, I think to this is an extremely extremely important drug, but because of the fact that it is the only approved drug and the fact that um, amyloid cardiac amyloidosis is still relatively rare, one of the biggest challenges is really insurance coverage, right? Because the medication is extremely expensive. In fact, it is probably one of the most expensive medications out there, period, within cardiology and outside of cardiology, right? So it is important for a center to really work closely with the phar pharmacy team and the technicians to have a process by which this medication can be approved. Because really without insurance, um, it is likely cost prohibitive for everyone. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Wan. Just for the sake of time, uh, we have a great audience here. We have a lot of questions still coming in, but we'll make sure we address all these questions um, on the Global Cardiology University website. I'd like to thank um, the entire audience for uh, showing up today. And also I'd like to specifically thank Dr. Wan for his great talk on amyloidosis. Just a couple of closing remarks. Uh, I'd encourage everyone who attended to visit the website, Global Cardiology University, and to join our community. It's a growing community with uh, learners from all across the nation and also learners across the globe. It's a great opportunity to enrich your knowledge in cardiology topics and also, importantly, to connect with uh, individuals at different stages from le in learning, uh, medical students, residents, fellows, and even early stage faculty and senior faculty. And it's a great opportunity to... Um, you know, connect with mentors and faculty that will help you grow throughout your careers as well. This is the um, information for Global Cardiology University. Feel free to reach out with any questions. Uh, there is a Twitter page, the X, uh, at Global Cardiology, at Cardiology University. We usually post any upcoming webinars, any upcoming events there. Um, and feel free to reach out to any of us as well with any questions. Um, if you simply go to the Global Cardiology University website as well, and you scroll down to the bottom, you can see any upcoming events. We are planning, hopefully, a, a, another webinar in May. Uh, the topic is to be determined, but I wanted to make sure that everyone has um, an idea how they can see where these upcoming events are. And again, everything's on the Global Cardiology University website. And we're, we're looking forward to growing as a community of learners. And again, uh, to build a cardiology community across not just the nation, but also across the entire globe. Thank you very much, everyone, again, for your time. And we look forward to seeing you again in our next webinar. And Mahmoud, just to clarify, can you just scroll down so that the um, the learners and those in the audience, so if you click on the view details on the upcoming event, if you're interested in, and you enjoy it, we, I certainly enjoyed Dr. Wan's uh, presentation. If you want to register for the next one, just because there is a limit, just if you're interested, register there. Uh, you can invite a friend that might be interested in it or even register a group. And then again, if I know there are a bunch of questions that weren't answered. Please submit them to us and, and we'd be more than happy uh, to address them. Uh, thank you again uh, for joining us tonight.